For those of you here in person, we've already chatted just for a little bit. We are welcoming in those who watch us online. It's the YouTube channel. Uh, you can find it by Emmanuel Baptist Church, Uncharted. That's probably the easiest way to find it. And uh, uh, just so that both those here in person and those who are watching online, just so that you know, we post it one week late. So, so sometimes I make a reference to something like Easter or something and it doesn't seem right. So it's just always a week off. But I really encourage you to stay with us, watch each week. Those of you who are in person, if I'm talking too fast and you didn't get it, it's great to go back and rewatch it and go, oh, that's what he said. And so uh, hopefully that'll be an encouragement to you. The study that we're doing together is the life of David, and we are coming to a juncture in David's life. Let me just describe where he's been and what's going to happen next. Uh, David's been living in caves. He's been living in the mountains. He's been living in the wilderness. He's been attracting guys who are discouraged and disheartened by the, the Saul's administration and his kingship. So he's been gathering guys. First he had 200, then he had 400. Now he's got about 600 guys. At some point, these guys also bring their families. And so the group has gotten bigger. So if you've got 600 fighting men and they're married and they've got kids and they've all got three or four or five, remember this is 2,000 years ago, or seven or eight or nine kids, uh, all of a sudden you realize this group is 3,000, 4,000 people. And David's responsible for them. He's responsible for feeding them. He's responsible for housing them. Now, he's housing them in caves. They're living in the mountains. It's a, they're bibwacked. They're, they're also a fighting force. And he is greatly discouraged. He's greatly discouraged. And out of that discouragement, he's going to make some really bad decisions. That's the juncture of where we're at with David right now. Now, this isn't going to last much longer in his season of life. Saul's time is going to come to an end. Saul is going to, we'll get to this part of the story, Saul, and for that matter, his son Jonathan, who we love, are, are going to be killed by the Philistines in battle. And when that happens, David will be, he'll be able to come out of hiding, and he will become the king of Israel. Uh, and he will be remembered always as their greatest king. To this day, the Israeli flag is the star of David. And so uh, he's going to become their, their greatest king ever. But this period of time isn't his high mark. This isn't where David just really is walking in wonderful faith. He is greatly discouraged. And he's going to make the kind of mistake that all of us make, all right? This is why I love Scripture. The reason I love Scripture is even the heroes of Scripture, they are presented to us with, uh, with warts and scars and acne and blemishes and all. And so we see that in David, and what's wonderful is then I see that in me. I, I, you, you open your Bible, and like a mirror, you go, well, that's me, I've done that. And you can see how God responds. So here is what I've got to do. I've got to stop the story of David. He is going to make a big mistake. But I need to explain to you why people make this mistake. And you're going to see yourself as much or more than David in this. And I don't want to lay it out for you this morning. I'm going to draw on the board a little bit. Uh, I did go on. I never, I never watched myself online. It's too brutal. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why you come back every week. I have no idea at all. Um, but I did recognize I need to write bigger. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, uh, and so here's what we're going to do. Uh, here, turn with me to John chapter 17. Turn with me to John chapter 17. You're like, see, that doesn't sound like David, right? Because it's all the way in the New Testament. And uh, let me show you what you need to know so that you can recognize this, not only, when it, not only when this temptation comes in your life, but when it comes in the lives of those that you love. Once you, once you see this paradigm, which is presented to us in Scripture over and over and over and over again. So this isn't just, this isn't just a one-time thing that you read in, in 1 Samuel 27. No, no, no. This is over and over and over again. In fact, the principles of it 
are found right here, given by Jesus himself in John 17. Let me remind you, John 17 is the night that he's betrayed. So the night that Jesus is betrayed, he's still explaining to us the principles that, that we need to live by so that we can live victorious Christian lives. So I got to start in the middle of a thought, but John 17 is what's frequently called the high priestly prayer of Jesus. The whole chapter is a prayer. The whole chapter is a prayer. John records it later for us, so we also can just assume that he prayed this prayer in front of the disciples. They, they heard this prayer. I, I want to begin in verse uh, 13. John 17, beginning in verse 13, Jesus is going to help us with an understanding. Let me tell you what to look for before I read it. He's going to talk about the difference between being in the world and of the world. Sounds like very small prepositions, just just the only difference in the statements. Are you in the world or are you of the world? Of the world. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 13 Jesus speaking to the Heavenly Father, but now I'm coming to you, and these things that I speak in the world, that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. Everything that Jesus told us, every commandment, every instruction, every admonition from the Lord is because he loves us and so that we might experience the joy that we were created for. And he reasserts that in verse 13. In verse 14, he says, I have given them your word. Stop there for a second. Why is it that when we meet, this is what we do? You, don't, you do not need my opinions. Most of the time, I don't need my opinions. I don't need your opinions. But we do need God's opinion, and God's opinion is fact. It's truth. We need the word. So what did Jesus give the disciples? What does he give us through the written word? He gives us God's word. Verse 14, I continue. And the world has hated them because they are not of, do you see the preposition of? They're not of the world. So stop for a second. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. Now everybody that is of the world is in the world. They are in the world and of the world. But you are only in the world. You are not of the world. You got it? You're like, no. Verse 15. Jesus prays a prayer for us. But first he tells us what he's not praying for us. Have you ever thought about that? Jesus intercedes for us. Did you know there's some prayers he doesn't pray for you? You're like, oh Lord, just give me this. Sometimes he goes like, no, I'm not, no, you're not getting that. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I want to get out of the world, don't you? I want to be in heaven. I don't want any more sin. I don't want any more sickness. I don't want any more winter, right? He says, no, the the Lord's not asking for that. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. So we're in the world. Jesus did not ask the Heavenly Father to take us out of the world, but to protect us. So we wouldn't be of the world to protect us from the evil one, verse 16. They are not of the world. He's talking about his believers, his disciples. He's talking about the children of God. He's talking about you and me. We are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So when you get saved, this thing happens to you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Now the phrase is in Christ. So now you're you're changed. Your heart has changed. Your soul has changed. Everything about you is different. And so just like Jesus is not of the world, neither are you. You're not of the world just as Jesus is not of the world. He finishes this thought. Sanctify them in the truth. So you guys hear me all the time. I talk, what I say? I talk about justification and sanctification and glorification. Like, why do you talk about all that all the time? Because Jesus did. Here's his prayer for you. His prayer is that you would be sanctified. 
That's his prayer for you, that you would be sanctified. And how are you sanctified? In the truth. Where can you find the truth? Your word is truth. This is where you spend your time. This is where you should study. When you sit down, you're like, well, what should I do today? And then you play computer solitaire, right? Well, what if you got this out and just let it do its sanctifying work in us? He says in verse 18, here's the finishing thoughts. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I I consecrate myself that they also may be, say it out loud, sanctified in truth. Okay, so that's probably all the scripture that we're going to look at today. Because now I'm going to build on this. And, And I hope that what I build, I hope when you leave, you go like, Now that makes perfect sense to me. So we're going to start with the believer. That's my B. The B is believer. The believer is in Christ. This is John 15. Abide in me, I'll abide in you. Abide in my love. So we are in Christ. But at the same time, and it sounds like it's a, it sounds like it's a riddle, but it's not. At the same time, We are in the world. Okay, so we're in Christ, but we're in the world. Jesus makes it clear to us. He says it on a couple of occasions. We are not, that's my not sign, we are not of the world. These are two different concepts. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We have been changed. We've been remade. We've been regenerated. We've been justified. We're on the way to being sanctified. One day we're going to be glorified. We are no longer spiritual orphans. We belong to God the Father. We are his children. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. The things that apply to us are completely different than the principles that apply to those that are of the world. And it's why, quite honestly, when you're having a conversation with somebody who is of the world, they don't get you. They think you're weird. They nod their heads. Oh, she got religion. Poor girl. Oh, he's going to be, oh, he's one of those now. And they just don't get us. But we are believers in Christ, in the world, but not of the world. John 17, all of that that I've just given you, make a, put brackets around it, make a note for yourself. In the margin, you can write, in, not of, and that'll help you with that. Now, we're in the world, not of the world. We shouldn't act like we're of the world. We shouldn't be given to the temptations of the world, but we blow it. Because we're not perfect yet. We're not in heaven yet. If we were in heaven, we'd be good. We'd be golden. Then, then our faith would be sight. We wouldn't be sinning anymore. But we're still here and we still blow it. When we get back to David, David's going to blow it. And I, I want you to see the bigger picture of it so that when we read it, you'll understand it. Now the reasons that we blow it are because of how Satan comes. Remember, remember Jesus' prayer. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but I do ask that you protect them from the evil one. So the evil one has got certain historical, tried and true attacks that are so recognizable that we, now through scripture, we started to identify different attacks in different ways symbolically. One of those attacks Let's see, let me go to a different color. That might help you just a little bit. One of those attacks is represented by the nation of Egypt. And Egypt is frequently alluded to by biblical writers as the world, right? And one of the big problems of the Israelites is they got out with Moses in the wilderness and they said... We want to go back to Egypt. And so Egypt is this picture of the world. It's not the only one, though. There's also, in Scripture, Babylon. And Babylon is frequently painted 
as a picture of the world, particularly when you get to end times prophecy. When you get to end times prophecy in Revelation, you're going to read about mystery Babylon. This is the, the world system that the Antichrist uses. And so Babylon is often used as a picture of the world. Not as often, but certainly it is there, is Greece. The Greeks are painted in the New Testament as those who give uh, rise to all of these uh, heresies and these intellectual uh, uh, fallacies that dissuade people from true faith. And so we find this fight, particularly in the New Testament, we find this fight that, that Greece and its intellectuals are a picture of the world. We also discover in Scripture, as we read it, that Rome is a picture of the world. All right? So I know I wrote Egypt out here, but I didn't have room for Babylon, Greece, Rome. The R is just there. So Rome is a picture of the world. In some end times literature, sometimes Rome and Babylon are kind of used interchangeably, kind of uh, uh, synonymously in that sense. Rome is the ruler of the world at the time of the writing of the New Testament. And so uh, we find that Rome is the place that uh, crucifies Peter upside down and beheads Paul. And we find that Nero burns the city but blames the Christians. We find that the Christians are thrown to the lions. Rome is a picture of of the world. And then there's one last picture that you might not recognize if you're not a Bible student. And these are, I said I was going to write bigger. I really am trying to, but these are the ites. You guys know who I'm talking about? The Jezreelites, the Jebusites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Edomites, the Pezrites, the Termites. <laughs> These are all the little groups that surround Israel or were a part of that until they conquered them in the Promised Land. And they're all mentioned in the Scripture all the time. And there's only one group that doesn't end in ites, the Philistines. But they're a part of the ites, okay? But we don't call them the Philistites. We call them the Philistines. All right? So we have the ites, and they are a picture of the world. And in fact, they're the, they're the group that Israel has the biggest problem with. Because they live beside them and among them and around them. They never conquered them. They're in the land. And so they compromise with the world with the ites all of the time. And this is why you have the book of Judges. They go, they, they go and worship with the ites and then the Lord cuts their blessing off and they come back to the Lord and he provides a judge for them and then they do it again and then they go back and forth. They do this back and forth and back and forth. Now, all of these temptations that are used by Satan are symbolized by these groups, Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Rome, and the Ites. But they all are used in particular ways. They're not all used synonymously, all right? They're used in particular ways. Egypt is, let me see if this color works. Egypt's temptation is pleasure, all right? Egypt's all about the pleasure and the children of Israel are in the wilderness and they said, we want to go back to Egypt because when we were in Egypt, there were the leeks and the onions and the garlic and we had great food and had good Mediterranean food, all the Mediterranean restaurants. We love that. It's the pleasure of that. And so whenever we are tempted by pleasure, it's it's referred to as being like Egypt. This is where Egypt tempts us in that sense. Babylon's temptation is wealth. And I'm going to add opulence because they certainly had it. It's money. We would talk about that. 
That's the temptation of Babylon. Um, when Nebuchadnezzar gets the dream about there's going to be Babylon and then the Medes and the Persians and then the Greece, uh, Greeks and then the Romans, uh, Babylon is the, is the head of gold. And he said there'll never be another world kingdom like Babylon. He said, even though the Greeks will be great, they're only going to be silver and our Medes will be silver and the Greeks will be bronze and the Romans will be iron and clay mixed together. But Babylon was gold. Babylon was everything that anybody ever dreamt it would be. The the, you know, the, the, the chariots were uh, Cadillac Escalades and BMWs and Mercedes. The, the homes were, were beautiful homes. The hanging gardens of Babylon. The, 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 the Babylon, ba- Babylonians started with Nebuchadnezzar. They had, they had feasts, like holidays, governmental holidays. Everybody was off. They had feasts that lasted for six months. How in the world could an economy, nobody work and everybody just eat and drink for six months? It's because Babylon was that rich. That's how rich they were. And whenever we are tempted by riches and wealth and materialism and stuff, can I add comfort? Because you're, like, you're thinking to your life, well, I don't have a problem with that one. Do you have a problem getting out of your lazy boy? <laughs> ah, see, that's... It's comfort. I got, a, I got the remote control. I got the lazy boy. I got the microwave. See, it's, it's still there for you. That's, that's Babylon. Greece is an entirely different thing. Greece is intellectualism. I, I'm so intellectual, I can't think how to spell intellectualism right now. It is a worldly philosophy Here's one way to remember it. It's all the isms. The isms are different than the ites. Don't get them mixed up, okay? Marxism, Darwinism, uh, uh, critical race theory, racism as a, as a philosophy of uh, how to deal with people like reparations. All the isms are a part of of the Greeks thought. In their days, it was the Stoics. It became uh, what we know as Socrates and Aristotle and their schools and their line of thinking. It was the Epicureans. Later in the New Testament, the New Testament church would have to deal with this because there were so many of these intellectual isms that would creep in the church. And they would say, it was a, they, would, they would have the Bible, but they, 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 they couldn't let go of their intellectual uh, pursuits. And so then they would, they would they would begin to interpret the Bible based on their own intellectual ideas. One of them was that everything that's a material, everything that you could touch, was evil. So since everything that's physical is evil, Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh. He was just a spirit. Which is why John, when he writes, says, we heard him, we touched him, we ate with him, we cried with him. We held him. Why does he, why does he go to the trouble to say all that? Because there was a heresy in the first century churches that Jesus wasn't physical. And so this is why he says we walked with him, we knew him. So he's reestablishing that. And this is all of the stuff that the world comes up with. Some of, it's, some of them are doozies, right? Some of them you know right away, you're like, ah, nobody's going to get fooled by that. But incredibly, a whole bunch of these intellectual things particularly capture the younger generation and then they become whatever. They become Marxists. They become uh, uh, critical race theory people. They got, they're going to change everything by their new isms. And this, right now it's wokeism in that sense. Rome is the temptation of power. All right? So there was no... There was no country that was ever, or ever as powerful as Rome. Even though Babylon was the richest of all the world powers, they never conquered as much territory as Rome did. When Rome rules from uh, before the time of Christ till well after the time of Christ, they expand all the way up into Europe, all the way into Asia, all the way down into North Africa. No world power had as much power or territory 
as Rome did. And Rome is this lust for power. Now, you can have it at its largest level. Your, your lust can be to be uh, Caesar or just to be one of the uh, commanders of Caesar, uh, one of the generals like Titus. Titus starts off being a general and then he becomes, he becomes emperor of Rome. And so it's, you can read these stories. They're like, they're like reading about Napoleon or Genghis Khan or anybody who wants to conquer the world. You can read them. But you also have inside of Rome these microcosm uh, power struggles. Uh, is, the, is the Senate going to rule over the Republic? Do the plebeians have a vote? Some of you have forgotten some of your Roman history, but all of these things happen internally. It has to do with slaves and taxation. And Rome was the first one that thought, let's just, let's just print more money. They, they didn't print it. They, they, it was still all in coins, but then they just reduced the amount of silver in the coin and made more of them. Does that sound familiar? So, so this, is, this is connected to government. But once again, you're like, oh, I'm not in government, but everybody wants power. Everybody wants the next job title. Everybody wants the promotion. Everybody wants to be in control of something, um, even if it's just little things in your house. So we had Patrice's kids that lived with us for a while. He works with the State Department in Kazakhstan. They've left now. We had them for eight weeks, and they didn't put things in the dishwasher right. <laughs> and I, I could see my power slipping away from me. Right? So we struggle. We have this. Don't. So, so sometimes when you talk about like, Rome and power, and you think, oh, okay, well, that's, that's Biden and Trump, and it's that level. No, no, all of this comes for you. And so you got to learn to recognize it. Now, the ites are interesting, because you might think to yourself, well, wait a second, if I'm tempted by pleasure, and I'm tempted by wealth, and I'm tempted by uh, intellectualism, and I'm tempted by power, well, what do I got left to be tempted by? Interestingly enough, there is this temptation of self-definition. Self-definition is the temptation that I, I, I don't want to be defined by God. I don't want to be defined by anybody. If you don't believe in God, you certainly don't say, I don't want to be defined by God. You just say, I don't want culture to define me. I don't want other people to define me. I don't want anybody to tell me who I am. I want to be me. Sound like a song you ever heard from Frank Sinatra? I've got to be me, right? So, so this is an age-old temptation of self-definition. The hot word today is self-expression. That's the, that's the word you're more likely to read. And here's the thing about it. we got to stop and talk about this a little bit longer than the others because it's a little counterintuitive. Everybody who chooses the path of self-expression, self-definition, nobody else is going to tell me what to do. There's no boss of me in my life. There's no authority that I listen to. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's what I'm going to do. Everybody who chooses that eventually ends up in a gang. You're like, what? What happens is when I choose to define myself a certain way because I'm not made to be alone, I look for people who define themselves the same way I define myself. So it sounds like, but it sounds like individualism. It's not. Because I don't want to be alone. And so if I define myself as gothic and I paint super black stuff on my eyelids and I dye my hair so it's super black and all my clothes are black and everything about me is black, I'm going to look for other kids who paint their face black and wear black. Ever seen it happen? Sure you have. So it's the craziest thing in the world. I want to define myself. How do I define myself? I get with other people who define themselves the same way. Now, this is, this is how gangs work. It can be the Crips and the Bloods. 
It could be MS-13. It can be the Hell's Angels. It all works the same way. This is who I'm going to be. I'm going to be a rebel. Nobody else is going to be like me. What do I do? I get, by, I get like other people who are like me. It's a crazy thing. But while it's easy to recognize with gangs and the cartel and motorcycle gangs and, and kids and what they'll do, happens to all of us as well. Your gang may not be called a gang. You might just say, well, I'm a cowboy. That's your gang. You might say, well, I, I, I just love NASCAR. Find that you gravitate to people who love NASCAR. People who love to watch cars go, vroom, 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 vroom. I have a friend that loves NASCAR so much, he listens to it on the radio. If you think vroom is boring on TV, vroom, vroom, whoa. Your gang is hunting, your gang is shopping, your gang is, we all gravitate to our gangs. Not all of our gangs sound like the Hells Angels. It can be the Elks Club, it can be the Moose Club. Do you get it? Are you following along? Self-definition, self-expression, I'm gonna be who I wanna be. Then you find people who are like you, that creates your gang. You want to know what the latest gang is? The biggest, hottest, coolest, latest gang? LBGTQ. Do you hear it again? Self-definition. I am who I decide I will be. Nobody else can tell me who I will be. This is how I will identify. And now I want to find other people who identify like I do. And it becomes a gang. Now you see it. And it's once you see it, you'll see it everywhere. My little messed up board isn't done. So the mistake of the believer, remember we started with the believer? The believer's in Christ. The, Jesus has told me, I'm not in the world, but I'm of the world. All right, all right, I'm not in the world, but I'm of the world. So I know I can't be like of the world, but I'm in the world. It's okay to be in the world. Lord told me he's not going to take me out, but can't be of the world. So I'm going to try to just live my life right there on the edge of that thing, right? I, I'm, I, I'm still in the world, so this is where I'm going to try to live, right there. And when you gravitate this way, instead of towards Jesus, you are in big trouble. That's what David's going to do when I finally get to him. When I finally get to David, he's going to be in big trouble because he just goes the wrong way. Now, the thing about this is, you think, the reason you think you can live right there on the edge is because you think, well, it's okay to experience a little pleasure. I can... I can just have one beer. I can just do this one time. Oh, this isn't who I really am. I'm really in Christ, but I'm still in the world, so I can, I'll, I'll enjoy this. But there isn't any sinful pleasure in the world that doesn't have teeth in it. And so every single one of these pleasures end in addiction. The Bible word is slavery. Every sin has got teeth in it that as soon as you give in to that one Lay's potato chip, you end up eating the whole bag. As soon as you give in to that, it is by its nature, listen very carefully, sin is by its nature addictive. So when you think you can just go and play with it a little bit, you cannot. Solomon said, no man can take fire inside his bosom and not get burnt. You can't do it. And incredibly, here we are 6,000 years after Adam and Eve, and you think you're the one guy. I know the lottery messes up a lot of people, but if I want it, oh, I'd be good with that money. You think you're the one. 
You think you're the exception to all of the rule, and it all ends in addiction and slavery. There are two kinds of addictions. There are the kinds that we all talk about because they are so obvious we can't help but talk about them. They are alcohol and drugs, sex addicts and gambling and all of these things that even the world talks about because they're so terrible. But then there are culturally acceptable addictions, right? Like watching television six hours a day. Nobody really ever talks about that. Eating too much. Sometimes the world talk about it if we get really, really obese, but for the most part, we all go like, yeah, I know I should eat less. I said that yesterday while eating a hamburger and fries. I said it while I was eating. <laughs> right? So what's, what's presented to me as pleasure ends in slavery, right? It's bait and switch. Do you get it? Yeah. Satan promises, but he never delivers. It's a trick. It's smoke and mirrors. What's the trick over here? This one just turns into superficiality. It turns into materialism. And the, and the superficial part of it is usually about your possessions, you know, the thing about possessions is they possess you. You know, there's a, there was a day and a time when uh, my family, we had one car. And you know what we really thought we needed would just set us free was two cars. When you get two cars, then you have twice the maintenance, twice the insurance, twice the, right? And then it's odd because then you realize, you know what I really need is three cars. Well, then you got three cars, but you only have a two-car garage. So what do you need? You need a different house with a three-car garage. You get a three-car garage, but then you realize right away, well, one bay is just for stuff. I still can't get a car in there. I need a four-car garage. When you get a four-car garage, you're like, I should have four cars. This is the, and then that, then that becomes your purpose for living. What are you guys going to do this year? We're going to build a new garage. What are you going to do this year? We're going to buy a new car. Oh, you got to get snowmobiles in there. You got to get the camper in there, right? It doesn't have to be Babylon to become so superficial. Life is just about your possessions. The thing about intellectualism is at the end of the day, anybody who would be intellectually honest, at the end of the day, there are no answers in intellectualism. I saw a great cartoon one time. This guy is climbing the mountain of enlightenment and knowledge, right? And it's like Mount Everest. And he's been, you can see in the cartoon, he's been climbing it for years. And he gets to the top of the mountain of enlightenment and knowledge. And there's a guy already there. And he goes, oh, I'm glad you're here. We're signing up nursery workers. A, what happens when you get to the end of intellectualism. There's nothing there. There's an entire book of the Bible written about this. The, the, the wisest, most intellectual man that ever lived was Solomon. And when he sought every single pursuit, he said, at the end, it's vanity, which means it's emptiness. And emptiness always gives to fatalism or determinism. There's one of your isms. And frequently, the people who are the most despondent in the world are intellectuals who started thinking, because I'm intellectual, I'll, I'll make more money and I'll go further and I'll, I'll find scientific discoveries and I'll solve the world. And then a few years later, they're just alcoholics in Egypt. Just took them longer to get there because they started thinking this was the answer. By the way, the scripture says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So anything that takes you away from this always leads you away. Oh, I'm running out of time. I gotta keep talking about these. So what happens with power? It leads to corruption. 
It always leads to lies. Always, 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 always. First you lie to the public, you lie to the masses that you have power over, you eventually lie to yourself. You, you lie to yourself so often that you're the only one who doesn't know that you're telling big whopper lies. Man, have I got a good illustration right here and I'm not gonna use it. Uh, this, leads, this leads to oppression. Can I say it this way? You remember, live by the sword, die by the sword. Live by politics, die by politics. This person thinks, by the way, some people start here with good intentions. This people thinks if we can just pass the right law, if we can just get the right people in office, if we just get the right president, all our problems will be solved. Uh Uh-uh. And it all just continues to rotate. Our founding fathers knew that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And whatever we have left of checks and balances we better use, I don't have time to go that direction. But there are many who choose this path and it ruins them. And because they have political power, they have the ability to take us with them. It brings me back to self-definition, self-expression. It brings me to the ites, right? So... Let's just follow the journey of any self-expressive person. I'm not going to be like the rest of you. You're the establishment. I'm anti-establishment. You work for the man, right? So I'm trying to use some language that I think some of you used in the 60s. Uh, The idea that I'm my own man, I'm going to call the shots, I will define who I am. Now, it doesn't matter how that gets played out. It doesn't matter which gang you choose to join. It doesn't matter. It all ends the same. Because that gang, they're not your friends. They will leave you faster than fast. They're using you like you're using them. It's, it's, it is a, what goes with this self-expression is counterfeit Spirituality. I meet people all the time now. This is, this is very common for me. I meet people who tell me that they're spiritual. And then when I dive down on that, I discover just their own made up version of something. It's self expression. Oh, I'm deeply spiritual. And then when I dig around in that a little bit, there's no spirituality there at all. It's just that I. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat organically and worship the rocks and trees. Okay, that's not spiritual. And you're missing a lot of good spaghetti. <laughs> so, you know, uh, what, what comes of this is always fear, insecurity, Doubt, depression, so here's, here's, here's what we're doing to a whole generation of kids. We're letting them, we're blessing them, no, not, we're not letting them, we're blessing them in their self-expressionism, which is going to ruin their lives. And we're telling them, you can be whatever you want to be. And the boy says, I want to be a girl. And the girl says, I want to be a boy. And so let's hustle you down to the doctor. And let's cut this off. And let's change that. And let's give you some hormones. And it is child abuse. And we're doing it. And we're fostering it and blessing it. And then they are waking up six months later, a year later, two years later. You want, you want to know what group, the, what demographic group in the United States has the highest suicide rate, transitioned kids after they've transitioned. And the LBGTQ group wants you to think it's because of our homophobia and our hate that they couldn't live. No, no, no. They woke up and realized they didn't have any of this that was promised to them. And they've They've done irrevocable things that they can't just change their bodies anymore. 
And the anxiety, oh, that's gotta be on the list. That's the biggest of all. So all the generations younger than us, full of anxiety. Uh, here, here, I'm gonna run out of time. So remember when COVID hit and the lockdown hit? Okay, we're, just going, we're all going to do, the Bible says confess your sins one to another, okay? So I'll start, I'll lead. How many of you are like me? I loved being alone. How many of you? <laughs> I had a guy say to me, he goes, I get to be what I've always wanted to be. I said, what's that? He said, a hermit. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't bothered by the fact I couldn't go certain places and things were closed down. I didn't go there anyway. Went on long walks, enjoyed myself, enjoyed my wife. Everybody younger than us couldn't take it. And they were on their phones, blowing them up, full of anxiety. They got locked down. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I was like, I'm going to go for a walk this afternoon and take a nap. Oh, I loved it. And they were just like, oh man, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what's going to happen in the world. Is this the end of the world? I was like, oh, I hope so. Right? I was completely different. What's the difference? The difference is a believer that's in Christ and someone who's trying to express themselves, but they're locked down to their bedroom and there's no one to express themselves to. Now, I'm out of time. Once you see this, and by the time, and so in your Bibles, you're looking for... Egypt, Babylon, Greece, Rome, all the ites. You're looking for how God's going to use the phrase, the world. And all of these are presented so that you who live in Christ, you will understand Jesus left us here in the world to do what? Well, he says in the end of that passage, John 17, even Father, as you have sent me into the world, I send them into the world. We have a gospel to share. We have a love that they need to know. We have salvation, the forgiveness of sins. We have something that somebody in every single one of these counterfeits wants and needs. That's why we're in the world. We are not in the world to just go right up here and try to live just as close to Egypt as we possibly can. That's a mistake. That's the mistake that David's going to make when we come back next time, 1 Samuel 27. He goes to live with the Philistines. Not David. No, not David. David killed Goliath. David would never do that. Now you understand the big mistake. I hope that not only does this help you, I hope it helps you understand your grandkids. I hope it helps you understand the world that we live in. This is not new. How old is Egypt? How old is Babylon? This is not new. The Lord has explained this in scripture for us. All you have to do is study your Bible and see it. And then when you see it, it helps you to recognize I'm in Christ. Yes, I'm in the world but I don't belong to the world. 